Hello everyone, I'm Ben Lombard and with me today is Mr. Raymond Nelson. Uh, Raymond is uh, the principal of the International Polygraph Studies Center. He's also a director of the American Polygraph Association and he's also a, a therapist dealing with uh, sex offenders post-conviction sex offenders for that matter as well. So Raymond, um, I'm going to ask you just tell a little bit about yourself and then um, I would also like you to tell us a little bit more about the post-conviction sex offender sure. uh, treatment program that, that has been in, in, the process, in, in place for quite some time. Right. Well, um, well, my name is Raymond Nelson and I'm a psychotherapist in the United States working with convicted sexual offenders and victims of sexual abuse. I'm also a polygraph examiner, as you said, uh, involved in polygraph research and poly dis policy development for sex offender treatment and supervision programs in addition to um, a lot of research with the polygraph it's, itself. In the U.S. we've been using the polygraph with convicted sexual offenders for over 40 years now, since the 1980s and uh, we've had pretty good success with it. It's an interesting program. It's, of course, it's one of those topics nobody wants to talk about, but um, the situation is that most convicted sexual offenders in the United States actually reside in the community. And so um, the goal of the polygraph is to provide another layer of support to the parole supervision uh, process that involves a lot of rules that we'd actually like people to uh, follow the rules for safety purposes and uh, success in the community and then of course therapy um, which is um, successful when people make use of it in the right ways. The um, situation we had with sex offenders is the tendency to manipulate and violate rules and uh, cross boundaries mm. and, and under report or just plain lie about what they're actually doing uh, during the um, during the week. There's a one hour a week where they're present in the therapy with their therapist or maybe an hour with their parole officer. But there's 160 hours every week, so that means there's 167 hours every week where they're not being directly face-to-face -face right. supervised by their therapist or probation okay. officer. So polygraph is a tool for broadening the scope of supervision and our oversight and increasing the level of engagement and honesty and compliance uh, with the uh, therapy and uh, probation supervision programs. Okay, so in a nutshell, um, if somebody gets left out of parole, this is where uh, the, uh, the, the, treat, the treatment program would be used effectively. Right, it would be a condition. In other words, instead of sitting in, in jail and rot, um, where they're not getting any treatment, or right. not the treatment that they should be getting. Right, um, there's not enough therapy in jail or prison and many convicted people actually have skills that are employable and the more they spend time in prison uh, the less employable they become so if possible we'd like to see them preserve their homes preserve their careers and uh, employability pay their own taxes uh, and preserve their family and, um, and, and be less of a burden on the overall economic aspects of the community so it's a, it's a, it's a good program they're going to be in the community eventually, unless they're, unless the plan is to incarcerate people forever, which that is almost never the plan. Right. So the the system works in such a way that um, obviously the parole officer is is overlooking this, and right. then you would have the therapist on the one side, and um, also the polygraph examiner on the other side, right. making sure everything uh, uh, falls in place. Is right. that right? That's right. And there might be other professionals involved as well. If right. there's a perhaps a psychiatrist, or if a person is involved in a is involved in a church or religious group, we'd like to involve those people. So we want to kind of maintain a network of communication among the various professionals that would surround an individual's functioning in the community, including perhaps their employers. So everywhere they go, they would have a sense of accountability that whoever they're spending time with today is going to be talking to the people they're going to spend time with tomorrow. Right. Okay, and uh, the, the beauty of it is that it does not have uh, to become a complete burden to the state. Uh, uh, 
managing this program? Is no, there yeah, many states in the U.S. actually um, consider being supervised in the community as an alternative to incarceration. We consider that to be a privilege, not a right. And mm -hmm. part of that privilege includes certain expectations, like they will follow certain rules and they will attend therapy. And, um, and many states require that uh, convicted people fund that themselves, they pay for that themselves. And, and we take the same approach to the polygraph. The polygraph is not as frequent as the therapist, but we have the advantage of being able to ask questions over protracted periods right. of time. So okay. it doesn't have to be as frequent. Yeah. But, it's not an economic burden to the um, community because the, uh, they pay for it themselves. Oh, so in other words, the treatment in, in most uh, states, the, uh, the convicted person would, would pay for right if they're for, on, for the treatment and the polygraph. Right, if they're on probation supervision, which yes. means they're allowed to reside in the community and work and maintain their kind of own economic self-sufficiency then the expectation is that they would pay for their own therapy and polygraphs. Okay. Now, um, certain things uh, can be monitored by means of that, and uh, we're, we're looking at the drug abuse, we're looking at um, preventing uh, sex offenders to be alone with, with minor children, or mm -hmm. frequenting um, places where the minor children are left on their own, and uh, also uh, preventing them from looking at pornographic material or even sharing pornographic material. So there's, right. there's a lot that, that we can do from a polygraph examiner's side to, to, to try and uh, make this, this world a, a better place yeah. for our children. So the assumption is, yes, you're right, the assumption is that sex offenders in the community will be safer and they will be more successful in therapy and more successful on probation or parole if they follow the rules and uh, tell the truth. And right. so some of the rules are quite simple, but in some ways complicated, like we'd like to know who they are involved in a sexual or intimate relationship with. If that if for some reason has to be a secret, there's some possibility that there's something wrong with it. Maybe their uh, intimate partner has children or the intimate partner right. is a vulnerable person. Um, pornography, we know, doesn't cause sexual offenses, but it does contribute to a lot of sexual thinking and sexual arousal, so we'd like to reduce that. We do impose rules like no pornography. And if somebody can't follow those rules, then it gives the therapist an opportunity to, to start to figure out, is it a problem of they don't want to follow the rules, or maybe they don't have adequate self-control to right. follow the rules. And those are two different problems with two different uh, therapeutic mm -hmm. approaches. Um, certainly some of the rules say, you know, don't touch children and don't be alone with children. And, and it's nice to be able to verify that. It's nice also to be able to catch people if they're violating right. that kind of rules. Yes. So very simple rules yeah. uh, in addition. So the goal is not to wait to catch people after they re-offend, although that is a goal too, uh, and it can happen. That's not really the primary goal. The exactly. primary goal is to prevent reoffenses by identifying lower level non-compliance behaviors that are indicative of an escalating risk level that would eventually culminate in a new offense. New offenses, it turns out, are not uh, terribly common, but when they do occur, they're very, very expensive in terms of the impact on the victim, the sure. family, the community, the neighborhood, the school, the church, the business. It's 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 a devastating uh, crime. From your experience as a therapist and also as a uh, well, long-standing uh, therapist, probably as as long as you've been a polygraph. And uh, um, what would you claim the success rate to be? Uh, yeah, that's a question for research, so yes. I, I, um, I don't probably responsibly want to guess at that. Um, but we do know that sex offenders are more successful. They follow the rules more From often. From experience yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I don't want to guess at what the numbers yeah. are, and I didn't we study have, that. Yes. That's not a responsible I, I, thing for a researcher to do. I understand. But, um, but we know, for example, from experience and, and some studies, that approximately half of the convicted people in the community are actually violating the rules of their supervision. Right. And they're violating the rules and instructions that their treatment program might ask of them, which are very similar to the rules of their supervision. Mm. Things like um, 
don't touch children and don't use yeah. pornography. Alcohol and drugs is certainly a rule as well. We ask people not to use alcohol and drugs, and we mean it. Mm. Um, we have other tools that we can monitor alcohol and drugs with, so we don't often use the polygraph for that. We mm. could, but polygraph is expensive, sure. and some of those other right. tests are less expensive. So we prefer to focus on the things that we don't have other tools to monitor, like like it would be nice if the therapist knows all of the different people that a person is engaging in sexual contact mm. with uh, for safety reasons mm. and uh, if we can uh, make sure that those people are uh, adequately informed about the supervision rules that the person the individual is subject to in terms of boundaries with children and pornography and if they have other expectations related to location or curfew in the community all right. Um, anything else? Uh, oh, um, anything else from your side, Raymond? What What is there which you, which well, you think, would like to bring to us? I, I think the most uh, important yeah. aspects of this are that the goal of polygraph is to support compliance with probation and supervision rules, and to support their progress and success in in um, sex offense specific treatment right. uh, through compliance with and with rules and also honesty in their discussion and self-reporting. We certainly as therapists we ask people what they're doing with their time every week. Mm. They don't always tell the truth. Many therapists make a living being lied to mm. and yeah. being, you know, hearing excuses and so it's a tool for kind of uh, slicing through that a little bit more rapidly and getting to the point of progress and getting to the point where um, the presence of convicted sex offenders in the community is less impacting to people because the mere presence of a sex offender in your neighborhood is harmful to the neighborhood, right? right? Nobody's happy about that right? And because they, uh, they create fear, even if they are following the rules. Right. So this is a tool for even for the offenders, if they are following the rules, to assure people that they are following the rules and reduce that impact of fear. For example, I have neighbors who have learned over time, with practice this, they, they would tell you that um, if you see them talking to children, you probably should contact the authorities, right? And right. having kind of set up that con contract and understanding with their own community, they stay away from children. <laughs> so it's, it's very nice. Simple as but, that. Yeah. We also know that the program uh, in, in has also been um, implemented in, in, the, in the UK with Certainly. great success. Um, it's something that, that we don't see in South Africa as yet, um, although we already have polygraph examiners that have had a specific training in this, in this field. We're also looking at um, the possibility of expanding that or even training more people in, in the nearby future. Um, and training and is not just for polygraph examiners, training is also for therapists, therapists right. and supervision officers yeah. who would need to become familiar and adept with right. how to make use of the polygraph in their right. work. But it could also uh, reduce the, uh, or uh, alleviate the overcrowding uh, of, of prisons as well in the process where people that, that uh, the court decide that this is a way to go. Uh, right. Uh, to, to, to alleviate that, that pressure as well. Oh well, yeah, as I said, many, many convicted people have skills that right. businesses right. and they could yeah. be using and if they are incarcerated for too long they lose that and then yeah. the long-term economic burden on the community is even greater and so if yeah. we can successfully you know the, the old saying the longer people live in an institutional setting the better they are at living in an institutional setting correct and if that's our goal I guess I understand, but oftentimes that's not really our goal. Our goal is sometimes if people have families, if they have children of their own, right. the goal is that families should be together if at all possible. And that's a difficult thing to do when somebody's convicted of a sexual offense. So we look, we look for ways to make that safer by broadening the supervision network around a person, uh, including by including other professionals in a, in a team a multidisciplinary treatment and supervision team and including the polygraph in that multidisciplinary treatment and supervision team so that we can ask people and observe people uh, for more than just one hour at a time and we don't have to um, rely solely on their self-report. The problem with self-reporting, even though it's very valuable, is that people have a tendency to massively under-report the problem behaviors right. that they're engaging in, how much alcohol they're actually drinking and how much pornography they're actually using and their
tendency to um, have poor boundaries with children, their tendency to find relationships that might not be healthy, intimate relationships that might not be healthy. And in general, uh, some sex offenders, many perhaps, have a tendency to use sexual behavior to remediate non-sexual needs uh, like exactly. stress or boredom yes. or loneliness or anger, frustration or sadness or, you know, whatever their problems is. So right. again, we want to evaluate every individually and find out their profile. Some people are criminally violent. Some people have serious personality disorder. Some people have their own traumatic abuse histories. Right. Uh, some don't. And some have serious mental health conditions. So it's going to be an individualized approach, but the polygraph can definitely be a very useful adjunct to supervision, court-ordered supervision, and court-ordered treatment. I'm quite enthusiastic about the fact that uh, South Africa is ready and right for this to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, um, yeah, if there are any other questions uh, that uh, either uh, Raymond Nelson can uh, answer or if, uh, whatever, uh, please feel free to call us. My name is Ben Lombard. My cell phone number is 0837931152. And I can also be reached, uh, both Raymond and I can be reached on the uh, email address info at polygraph-training.co.za. Thank you very much for Thank that uh, informative uh, session and uh, looking forward to seeing this being implemented. So. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you for your questions. Thank you.